Good morning, and welcome to Tabernacle United Methodist Church. My name is John Woods, and I'm the pastor here. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us as we unite our hearts to worship our Savior Jesus Christ together. If you are a guest with us, we want to extend a warm welcome to you and tell you how glad we are that you've chosen to be with us as we worship Jesus. If you are a part of our Tabernacle family, welcome to you as well. Hey, today is a day that the Lord has made. Our call is to unite our hearts, to worship our Savior, and to celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ's presence among us. So friends, let's prepare our hearts now for the worship of Almighty God. We do that at first by joining our voices together, even in our own homes, and singing in praise of our Savior. Friends, as we gather together to unite our hearts in this time of prayer, I want to encourage you to be uh, particularly mindful of the Kiger family and of the Proctor family this week and uh, the special needs that they have. Uh, among many others, we do want to be faithful in our prayers for these families. We also want to be mindful of all of those who continue to struggle economically, for those who are struggling uh, with uh, the social isolation that has come because of this COVID virus, and for all of our healthcare workers and emergency responders, those who are caring for our community in so many ways, let's be intentional in our prayers of coverage over God's blessings for them as well. As you are able, I want to invite you to now bow your heads and let's unite our hearts as we come before our Heavenly Father in prayer. So let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are the God who makes all things new. You bring hope alive into our hearts and you cause our spirits to be born again. Thank you for this day and for this new week as we step into this new year. We thank you for all of the potential that continues to be before us. Father, we start this new year uh, aware that it is full of all kinds of unwritten stories and new opportunities. And together we pray that you might use us to be all that we can be over these next 12 months, that we might offer these, uh, these weeks and these months that are before us to you and to your glory, that it might be a time for us to unite our hearts in our ministry to this world, to care for those who are in need and to offer a sense of hope to those who find themselves in dark and difficult times. We pray especially, Lord, that you continue to be with us, that your presence would be felt in all things. And we ask that you would extend into each one of us the wisdom and the strength and the courage to meet each new day and each new challenge head on and full of eagerness and full of the wisdom that comes from you. Let this year be one that is filled with things that are truly good. 
Let us look beyond the mundane and the struggles to see the blessings that wait before us around every corner. Bless us with the warmth of strong relationships, with the strength to hope that those in our community who need uh, hope might find it in us, and the courage and the humility to accept for ourselves this call that you have placed upon us to be your salt and your light in this world. As we consider those who are around us who are struggling uh, with illness and with disease, with fear and with frustrations, with uncertainty, we ask, Lord, that you would place your hand upon our hearts, that our spirits would find comfort in your presence and in knowing that you are above all, that you are the one who uh, makes all things new. We pray for our nation. It's been a difficult week, and we ask, Lord, that you would be seen in all things, that we would have an awareness of your activity and of your plans for us. We pray for those who continue to care for those who are ill and sick, for those who place themselves uh, in harm's way so that we might be cared for, and for those who work so hard day after day, night after night, to make sure that our community is able to function the way that it needs to. We ask that you would protect them, that you would uh, place your hand upon them, strengthen their spirits and their resolve to care for our community. We pray for our church, asking, Lord, that we might shine your light, that we might extend the good news of your gospel, and that we might uh, be full of compassionate care to those who are struggling these days. That only happens as you are working within us. So we pray this day, Lord, that you would be at work among us and through us. Empower us to shine your light. Give us your words. Give us your wisdom. Give us your courage to live each day as your follower. We pray this as always in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who came to live among us, who healed those who were sick, who offered hope and good words to those who are struggling, and who, when he was asked, gave his disciples the prayer that we now join in praying ourselves. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, one of the ways that God is able to make those prayers become a reality as, as we partner with him in his work in this church and in our community we're able to do that as we offer all that God has blessed us with, our strength, our prayers, and our financial resources. We come now to this time of offering, and I want to encourage you to be faithful in supporting Tabernacle Church and our ministries together. One of the ways that you're able to do that is through our Easy Tithe app. It is easy and a way for you to give electronically so that the ministry might continue to be strong so that others might find that Tabernacle is a place of refuge and of hope and of light in dark and difficult times. I remind you as well of our Christian Life Center. Uh, we have begun payments on our mortgage for our new building, and I want to invite you to be intentional in supporting our Christian Life Center and the ministry that God is already beginning to do in there. So now, as you are able, I want to invite you to use this time to reflect on all of the ways that God has blessed you and to be mindful of the ways that you can return some of those blessings back for God's kingdom use.
So a number of years ago, I was pastoring a church. I had not been there very long when one of the church members came up to me after the worship service was over. We had had communion that day in worship. And the day before, on Saturday, she is the person who had baked a loaf of sourdough bread for us to serve as communion. She came up to me and she said, Pastor there is another loaf of sourdough bread. I've wrapped it up in tin foil. I, I put it underneath the pulpit for you and for your family to have for lunch today. <laughs> her name was Dot. Not, not that anybody ever called her Dot. Everybody called her Mama Dot. And Mama Dot said to me, Pastor John, do you eat chicken? <laughs> do I eat chicken? I said, Mama Dot, I am a preacher, my goodness. How many preachers have you ever heard of who don't eat chicken? I I've eaten so much chicken that my wife says when I'm asleep, I don't snore, I cluck. Of course I eat chickens. She said, well, that's good. Because Bob and I, Bob was her husband, Bob and I would like to have you and your family over for dinner one night. I have a special chicken recipe that... I think is really pretty good, if I do say so myself. So we made the arrangements. Now, I have to say, I've had about every possible way that chicken can be cooked. So I really wasn't expecting a whole lot. But when we got to Mama Dot's house, oh my goodness, my children, they perked up when she took the chicken out of the oven, and there was this full layer of crushed uh, 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 potato chips all across the top of the chicken. We sat down at the table, and I took my first bite. And I have to say, I discovered that Mama Dot was wrong. It was not good. It was amazing. <laughs> it, it makes me smile just thinking about that chicken even today. Because it wasn't just good. Mama Dot's chicken was incredibly better. It was just better. I'd never had it like that. Now, listen, I know that you're at home, but could I get you right where you're at this morning to say better? Just right there in your own home, right on your sofa. Just say it with me. One, two, three, better. That's right, better. Uh, let me ask you, how many of you want to have this year be a better year than last year? I think all of us do. Of course you do. You'd be crazy not to want to have a better year this year than last year. And I have to say, after this past week, our nation needs better. Our church needs better this year. Our community needs better this year. Our businesses, our families, we all could use better. The tragic thing, though, is so many people are pursuing what we might call the good life. 
oh, you know, we, we want nice things, we want comfort, we want convenience, we want fun. And there's nothing wrong with all of those things as long as God is uh, all of our heart, as long as he has all of our heart. But the tragedy is that so many people are settling for the good life when God has something that is indescribably better for them. Today we're starting a brand new sermon series, and the title of the sermon series is Better. And what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks is we're going to be looking at some different Bible verses that have the word better in them. <clears throat> Today, I want us to start with this passage from Psalm 84, verse 10. Now, I want to start in Psalm 84, verses 1 and 2, just to kind of give us a little bit of context for verse 10. <clears throat> and here's what the Bible says. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, it even faints, for the courts of the Lord. Now, now some of you might say, what is this, the courts of the Lord? I don't know what that is. Why would, why would your soul yearn for the courts of the Lord? Well, well any time that you see this phrase in the Scripture, any time you see it in the Old Testament, that's kind of a, a picture. It's a, it's a symbol and it represents the very presence of God because God would dwell there in the temple there in Jerusalem. And so the people, they would go into the courts uh, around the temple just to get as close to God's presence as they possibly could. And so the psalmist says, My soul yearns, it even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out, for the living God. Then down in verse 10, the scripture says, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Better is one day in your courts the psalmist says, than a thousand elsewhere. Hey, you know, I, I want to encourage you, just right there in your own home, one more time, right there on your sofa, to say that with me. Better is one day, come on, say it with me. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Hey, one more time, one more time. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. In other words, better is one day with God than any other kind of day anywhere else with anybody else. Now, sadly, the problem is there are way too many people who simply do not believe this scripture. You know, from time to time, I hear people who ask questions. They'll say, why in the world would I want to wake up early on my day off, why would I want to get dressed in some uncomfortable clothes and go to some church service that sometimes is a little boring, sometimes feels a little bit dead? Why would I want to be limited by a bunch of rules that somebody else imposes on me? Why would I want to be a part of something that sometimes, to be honest with you, feels a little bit legalistic, feels a little bit judgmental, sometimes is kind of anti-fun? Well, there's a significant misunderstanding about what Christianity and what following Jesus and having a, a faith relationship with the Lord really is about. And, and so a lot of people, uh, they just simply don't believe that better is a day with God. Uh, they think that Christianity is not really for them. And I don't know, but maybe, maybe some of you feel that way right now and you're wondering, how is this possible? Why would a day with God be better than a, a thousand anywhere else? Well, let me just tell you, it's better because it's with God. And, and God's ways are higher than our ways. God's ways are better than your ways or my ways because with God, we have the kind of life that we were created for. We are able to have the kind of a life that we have been made to experience. And so Scripture says that His love is better. It's better than life itself. A day with God is better. Because frankly, with Christ, 
uh, we have the blessings that come from him. We have uh, the forgiveness of our sins. Your sins can be separated from God's eyes. In fact, the Bible says as far as the east is from the west. He never holds those sins against you as you confess them to him. I remember the story some years ago in a, in a large city. There were rumors that were beginning to spread about a, a certain Catholic woman who was having these visions, these mystic visions of Jesus. Well, reports uh, reached the archbishop about her, and he decided that he would go and check her out and talk to her himself. And so he, he asked her, he said, Is that true, ma'am, that you are having visions of Jesus Yes, she replied. The archbishop thought about that. He didn't really want to believe it, so he said, well, listen, the next time that you have one of these visions and you have a conversation with Jesus, I want you to ask Jesus to tell you the sins that I confessed during my last confessional. The woman was shocked. Did, did, did I hear you? Archbishop, are you sure that you want me to ask Jesus that? Ask him exactly that. And please come and tell me if anything happens. Well, he didn't hear anything for about nine or ten days. And then ten days later, the woman comes to the archbishop. And she says, I, I did exactly what you told me to do, sir. I asked Jesus to tell me the sins that you confessed in your last time of confession before him. The archbishop leaned it forward. His eyes narrowed. And what did Jesus say to you? He asked. Bishop, the woman said, these are his exact words. I can't remember. A day with God is better because with Jesus Christ, we have the forgiveness of our sins. A day with God is better because you have the security of knowing that you are a part of the family of God. You've been adopted into God and are a part of all that God is about. A day with God is better because you have joy unspeakable. Even in the midst of hard and difficult and painful times, we can have joy. Your happiness is not based on what's happening at work and with your job or in this nation or in our world because there is a joy that comes from God that transcends all of that. A day with God is better because no matter what is going on in your life, you can have the supernatural peace that passes all understanding, even in the middle of trials and in the midst of temptations. A day with God is better because you have His divine calling and purpose for your life. When you wake up in the morning, you know that God knew you even before you were even born. He knew you in your mother's womb, the Bible says, and all of your days days of your life were ordained and written in his book before even a single one of them came to be. So we have, you have, and, and I have a, a unique calling. We have a unique purpose. We have a, a, a unique a contribution to make in this life and in our, uh, this world that makes this day better. I have his power a day with God's power is better because if you are a Christian, the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives inside of you. And you have access to the very throne room of God. A day with God is indescribably better. Now, what I'm not saying, and, and I hope that you will hear me very clearly, what I'm not saying is that you're never going to have any trials what I'm not saying is that you're never going to have any hard times. What I'm not saying is you're, that everything is going to always be great. That's simply not true. What I am saying is that in the middle of the storms, if you let him, Jesus can be your peace in the midst of that storm. But it doesn't mean that there won't be any storms. It just means that it's better to be in a boat, in a storm, with Jesus than to be on the shore without him. 
Because a day with him is better than a thousand elsewhere. A day with God simply is better. Hey, but in order to get there, you have to DTR. Some of you will recognize those letters and what they stand for. DTR, that stands for define the relationship. Now, if you're not familiar with that phrase, Uh, This is kind of the official talk that takes place at some point in a relationship to determine the level of commitment. You define the relationship and you decide where things stand between the two of you. Is this a, a, a casual friendship or are you wanting a committed relationship? You have a DTR. Are you just friends or is there more to it? I remember the very first DTR experience that I had. It was in, uh, well, it was in second grade. In my class in second grade, there was this amazing girl. Her name was Jill, Jill Keller. She was smart. She was friendly. She was popular. She had this incredible smile and this long brown hair. And best of all, Jill sat in the desk right next to me which was great because what that meant in second grade was that we also sat right beside each other at lunch in the cafeteria. And at lunch, do you know, she would share her little Debbies with me. (laughs) It was great, and we were wonderful friends. But when you're around that kind of a second grade person all day, every day, pretty soon a young guy's heart begins to mush a little bit. And I began to think, well, she's really pretty friendly with me. I'm pretty friendly with her. I mean, really, who shares their little Debbies with just anybody? Maybe, maybe we should be more than just friends. And I knew it was time for the DTR talk. And I knew how to do this. I'd done this. uh, I'd seen other people do that. I ripped out a sheet of of clean three-ring notebook paper And in very careful handwriting, I wrote what you might call the note. You know that note, right? Very carefully, I scrawled, do you like me? And underneath that, I wrote two boxes. One, a really big box, and underneath that said yes, and then a little small box, and underneath that one it said no, DTR. I folded up that note a couple of times and I slid it over to her during math class. Well, that afternoon during recess, the note made its way back to me and my heart was beating so fast. This was it. I opened it up and my heart soared. She had checked the box. Yes, she liked me. And not only that, I looked, I saw she had written a note underneath at the bottom of the page. And I thought, how good is this? Not only does she like me, but she's already writing notes to me. But then I read the note. And Jill Keller said, of course I like you. You're my best friend. Aren't you also Bobby Ascara's friend? Would you ask him and see if he thinks I'm cute? <laughs> I was crushed. She liked me, but, but not the way that I liked her. And maybe you're sitting there saying, John, what in the world are you trying to say with all this? Simply this. That in every relationship, but especially in our relationship with God, there comes a point when it is important to DTR, to define the relationship. And to see if things have moved past kind of a casual one hour a week uh, admiration and and casual friendship and acknowledgement towards a deeper devotion and commitment to Jesus Christ. That's what the psalmist has done. He's examined his relationship with God and he has decided that of all the places that he could go, of all the the people that he could be around, that being in the presence of God was the one place that he wanted to be more than anywhere else. To find himself under the shadow of God's love and under his grace and filled with his peace and surrounded by God's presence. 
he had decided that a day with God is better. And I want you to hear that that's what God is hoping you will do too. That you will define your relationship with him. Is he your savior? Are you willing for him to be the Lord of your life? Is there a a hunger to be with him? Not just one hour a week, but 24 hours a day as we spoke about last week. Uh, A Wi-Fi 24 hours a week seven days a week kind of a relationship, will you decide that a day with God is better than anything else that you might want? Now, here's what's really interesting about this, and let me just share this one last thought, and then we'll finish up for today. In the Old Testament, God would dwell there in the temple, and, and God's people would decide to be in the temple courts there so that they could be close to God, so that they could come to God. And so they would travel and they would come and congregate around the temple courts. In other words, you would have to go somewhere in order to be with God. But in the New Testament, for those of you who are Christians, the Bible actually says that We are, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to go somewhere else in order to be with God. God has come to be with you, to dwell inside of you. And because of that, you can literally have a day with God. Not just a little bit of time with God, but you can have a day with God. And here's what's really amazing. If you can have a day with God, you can have a week with Him. And if you can have a week with God, you could, well, well, you could have a month with God. And if you can have a month with God, you can surely have a year with God. And if you can have a year, you can do life with an ongoing, unending awareness of God's presence in you and with you. When you're driving to work, when you're texting your mom, when you're going to the grocery store, when you're studying for your chemistry exam, when you're eating dinner with your family, you can do all of that with an unending awareness of God's presence right there with you every single moment. You literally can do life with God, which is great because better is a day with God than a thousand anywhere else. And it all begins with your decision to make this year and to make your life one that is better. Hey, I want to invite you to bow your heads and let's ask God to be a part of our better life now. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for this gift of being able to be with you, for the time in which we have been able to to think about how our life is better because of you. And we pray, Lord, that you would come and be with us, that you would manifest yourself in such a clear and profound way that there would be no question but what our life is better by being in your presence, by having you in our life and in our hearts. So, Lord, we open ourselves up to you. We invite you, Lord, to be a part of all that our lives contain so that as we go through every single day, we might find that we have the strength, the resources, the grace, and the goodness to be your light for others. Bless us, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, who is with us and gives us life that is better. Amen. Hey, as you're able right there in your own uh, living room on the sofa, I want to invite you to lift up your voice in praise of our Savior Jesus. Sing to him so that he hears the joy that he puts in your heart. Worthy of every breath we could ever 
I'm so glad that you have chosen to be with us as we've worshipped Jesus Christ together this day. My prayer is that as you go into this next week, that you would look for this week to be one that is characterized by the better that Jesus Christ offers to all of us. Friends, go forth from this place and this time together in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ. And may God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you and your family now and forever. Amen. Go in God's peace and God bless you.